Today what I want to do is present an experimental keynote that draws from my academic research as well as from my creative writing practice. So rather than starting with the objective of producing coherence, let me say at the outset, this is fragmented. There are parts that don't cohere. It's, there, it's a precarious piece, and I imagine it that way, of what I'm calling queer or queer femme environmental writing. I think of this as a mixed and an unruly genre, and it doesn't adhere to disciplinary rules or the object-subject divide. Um, but instead, for me, it has its target as undoing the colonial Anthropocene. And this is not to proliferate more terminology or put adjectives again in front of the Anthropocene, but to name the specificity and the periodicity that is colonialism. Further, I've come to believe that experimentation is the hub of creation. And so in what follows, I want to honor the queerness of water in six parts. So let's begin. So don't tell me how love will rescue me. I was carnivorous about love. I ate love to the ankles. My thighs are gnawed with love still, and yet I cannot have loved, since living was all that I could do. And for that, I was caged in bone spur endlessly. Dion Brand, Ossuaries. One, imbibing the river, a love story. I have often pined for a sublime view at the river's edge. This summer, I find one, a view that extends over five kilometers of sweet, salty water, and that changes color with the passing hours. The apartment of this view shares a wall with a blue ceramic church whose bells chime all day. They remind me, and all who hear them, that whatever else we are doing, we are always on church time. The Duro River in Porto is mostly golden, and it's a hungry serpent of a river. When I look out over it from the tiny apartment, I think about Carolina Caicedo and who, her lucid art of liquid reverence and dispossession. In her film, Land of Friends, that I wrote about in the extractive zone, Caicedo's practice is set on the Yuma River in southwestern Cauca, Colombia. In the film, she describes how indigenous and rural peoples continue their fight against hydroelectric damming and the managed disappearance of the river. This fight has led to an incredible new legislation to protect rivers, to keep the arteries of Madre Tierra, Pachamama, alive. I wonder, do rivers understand their rights? As I walk along the middle planks at the river's edge, I feel the river gazing back at me. I sense a liveliness on its own terms. In my love for the river, I reach for mutual beingness to undo its thingification. I queerly behold what is incommensurate between us rather than trying to possess. Yet I'm scared that hovering above the powerful river, I will fall into the gap, perhaps between the industrial grates into the currents below, tumbling tumbling between my imagination and expectation, falling between categories of being back into the known, falling in line with the normative infrastructures of growth, development, domination, seeing, a way of being I never wanted or can sustain. I watch as a single drop of accumulated sweat pours down my leg and dissipates into the river, a communication of sorts, my longing, a poetic ode to the river that aims to escape narrative closure, a river kiss to heal the imaginaries of kings and their aqueducts, an intimate gesture to undo the corporate bullies and their bulldozers. In this land of conquistadores and faded glory, the river is a liquid territory of world historical empire, the waterways, the means of colonial powers, consolidation, trade, enslavement, extraction, debt, Metal and carbon commodities stolen and transited from Africa and the Americas to Europe. Competing imperial roots and ruins that imprint the water with the traces of colonial violence. The bells chime again, and I'm reminded about how close I am to the edge of ruin, how close the human clock is to its end. 
How do I wake up more fully to inhabit the earth more queerly? As I walk the final half block to the tiny apartment with a view over the Golden Dora River, I feel the breeze of the water caress my face. A little girl waves to me from a rusted barge ship with colorful flags and dozens of paying tourists traveling there. They all seem oblivious to the voracious mouth of the Atlantic Ocean and the palimpsest of liquid history. I must watch my step, I think, waving back, or I'll slip back into narrative failure, slipping and sliding into the dead horse bay, as I am in immersed there, slipping into extinction. Is the ocean a lesbian, too? Recently in the UK, the author Julia Armheld published the queer novel Our Wives Under the Sea, a lesbian love story that takes place in a shipwrecked vessel on the ocean floor. In a separate essay published in Lit Hub, if you want to look it up, she argues that the ocean must be a lesbian. This is not a new argument, as popular culture has become obsessed with lesbians at sea, and a recent episode during season two of Hatch that takes place in a cruise ship confirms that for me. What I think Armhel means, however, is by making such a strong argument, is also to point to the sea as a sensual space, one that is both familiar and strange, a diving into the potential of the non-normative unknown. For me, the ocean is queer, as far as it is an immersive experience that exceeds the normative gravitational pull of land and earth. It is also the place on earth where one can most easily feel subjective dissolution and where its wetness and its salty liquid buoyancy becomes a powerful metaphor for queer desire. Yet I am weary of the YouTube videos and memes that want to definitively proclaim that C is a lesbian or that the sea is queer and that do so through anthropomorphism, gay dolphin parties, queer well mating play, male seahorses that grow a placenta, you know the genre, although admittedly this last one impresses me. As an alternative to anthropomorphisms of many kind, I propose this queer, critical, decolonial femme readings and an environmental writing practice otherwise. I'm not sure I'm completely performing it for you today, I'm still working it out, but it's a practice I'm interested in rehearsing to eschew narrative conventions that reify or humanize the object of our study. To submerge into a decolonial space of practice, as while Mapu artist Francisco Wichokeo does in Queering and Thinking Anew, the Ophelia story, to proliferate critical reading practices and writing approaches that chronicle, perceive, and narrate out of the colonial divide, and into, instead, a queer femme space of care, imaginations of roots out, communal living, writing the past, present, future of what Christina Sharp calls the weather, to name racisms of all kind, or what I refer to as thinking and being beyond the colonial Anthropocene. This isn't a space of sheer jouissance, but also a way to mourn and attend to all that has been lost and disappeared, the dead and coral, the diminishment of biodiversity, the universalisms of monocultural, the monocultural divide, the tempted end of the whale, and not to mention the inhabitable world as we know it. Yet, in my eyes, such an imaginary would not see the plastification of the ocean as our only dystopic horizon, but would also linger in the arts of the submerged, would play with the femme arts of the invisible, attending to the remainder, the remains, the precarity, and to the beautiful and terrible order and disorder of our collective existence. Three. Enter Seba Galfukeo and Victoria Hunt. Seba's blue water performances, its sonic bells, the chiming in the body of work, are the antithesis of church bells. These bells resound as a call to ancestral memories, 
to an auric state of sensuality that vibrates with the river body. Their incredible work on water emerges from occupied, militarized, while Mapu territory, an indigenous geography that exceeds the nation state container of Chile and Argentina, where Seba's body becomes with and part of the liquid surround, as do we. In this performance, in their performances, we hear the language of the river, where there is no split between the human and the non-human. The rivers of the deep south, its generative waterfall have been diverted, privatized, turned into electrification for the cities. And though we sense an alternative non-binary liquid earth energy, we see the bright blue of the Permenton or the dreamscape of Mapuche cosmology, the blue, blue, the political blue of collective anti-colonial imaginations where there is no separation between the indigenous body and the liquid territory. The body then here is not an archive, but an imprint, a trace, anti-colonial, genealogical, relational, more than human ontology. Now Gramsci. In the prison notebooks, Antonio Gramsci wrote a passage that Edward Said resurfaced in the first chapter of Orientalism. It reads, quote, the starting point of critical elaboration is the consciousness of what one really is, and it is knowing thyself as a product of the historical process to date, which has deposited in you an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. Therefore, it is imperative at the outset to complement an inventory, end quote. For Gramsci, making that inventory is the imperative which becomes a ground of one's own critical position. But what is it for indigenous and black artists, thinkers, makers? There is no infinity of traces that can assume the separation between history and the body. For instance, queer Maori artist Victoria Hunt, like Seba Calfoqueo's performance practice, centers their embodiment in relation to liquid territory. She traces her lineage as part of an artistic practice, as part of a living webbed identity whose embodied indigenous ancestral work reconstitutes the Thakapapa, or the Maori lineage. And working with Victoria Hunt, she taught me that the Thakapapa is a central principle in Maori indigenous knowledge meaning the process of layering one thing upon another and that there's a genealogy for every word, for every thought, for every object, for every mineral, for every place, for every person. Imagine that beautiful and intricate complexity. This starting place that is not inscribed in the mono eye, the single eye of the colonial matrix. A decolonial and queer relation to the waterways that begins with the web of life. Hunt, and you'll hear more about her work later in the interview with her, and filmmaker Juan Francisco Salazar, do not merely perform an archive of sea and water memory or stand separate to it. The body is those traces, a trace of an ancestor's lineage, as well as indigenous cosmologies of water, the inhabitants. And just to remind us, right, why the liquid, why the ocean? This is the liquid mantle of the ocean that undergirds the solidity of all the planetary continents. So I open this talk with Diane Dion Brand's poem, Archive Ossuaries, that you should definitely listen to on Audible. They too remind us of the trace as presence, love as a site of non-dissolution, where the Africana body and cultural memory meld with the queer decolonial otherwise. In other words, there's no digging for bones here. There's no external museological collection. Unlike Gramsci, who reads his subjects as an infinity of traces within the global history of blackness, as Ossuaries makes clear, there is only the indistinguishability of the speaking subject from the world of traces. 
What is insurgency then? I've learned from Dion Brand, from Seba Calfuqueo, and from Victoria Hunt that insurgency is actually to rethink the history of revolutionary potential as made anew from the speaking, writing, enacting body. Four, beach access. My first sea edge was the Pacific. It was a sea that extends from the Antarctic, it is a sea that extends from the Antarctic region to the south, to the Arctic north, lies between Asia and Australia on the west, and North America and South America on the east. And of course, I could re-say that if I knew it all in indigenous geographies. After I left Chile with my family during Pinochet's regime, we arrived to the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. It was already very hot there. I learned about the Pacific Sea Edge from my grandmother, Baba, a striking woman of a voracious sexual appetite, or so it seemed to me as I watched her flirt on the beach with people of every gender all the time. Baba also taught me how to swim. During the heat waves of the late 70s and 80s, when it was already too hot to stay indoors without air conditioning, she piled us into her green pinto and took us to the two-mile stretch of the beach called Zuma Beach, that resides upon Gabriolino indigenous territory and Malibu. But I didn't know it resided upon indigenous territory then. Zuma Beach is one of the most diverse places in the world. Black, brown, immigrant humanity, all on glorious display. The crystalline beach Zuma in Malibu, of course, has a history. It's located near fragile dunes. It was first called Duna by the Spanish conquistador. And then in 1793, its name was converted to Duma to honor Padre Francisco Dumetz of the mission San Buenaventura, the last established by Juniper Serra. We are always on church time, as I've said, though as Jack's work reminds me, it's always struck through by queer time and place. Recently, I've been reading and writing about beach access, its lack of access, privatization, deregulation, the dismantling of the beach as a space of the commons, and it takes place every single day. Like much legislation to protect land and the body in the United States right now, the beach acts of the 1970s have been under attack. Property owners deploying their security and wealthy seaside towns have removed parking spaces, imposing stiff fees to keep the public away from the public beach. You might have noticed this everywhere in the world. This is actually a huge wave of this privatization going on right now. The public beach at the edge of Malibu taught me to be fearless. Next. I got tumbled time and again but it taught me, too, to swim for my life, to get up and to dive in again, searching for pods of wild dolphins, to be a queer femme in the becoming, in the exhaustion of the waves. At its edge, I waded and tumbled and swam and played with the sea. In Cecilia Vicuña's incredible film, Con Con, about the north of the Pacific in the su southern hemisphere in Chile, she orients to this play to the pleasure of being in contact with the wild Pacific. As she says, I reached out towards her, and she sensed me too. Like Vicuña, I seek dissolution in the tiny bubbles along the Pacific sea's edge. Five, sea edge thinking. Sea edge thinking actually brings with it pain and the sorrow of coloniality but it also invites us into play and pleasure, the pleasure of queer being. In this sense, I am led to the space of the Black Shoals that Tiffany Lethabo King so beautifully renders as a metaphor for what is neither land or sea, a space where Black and Indigenous histories meet and converge, an alternative mapping to the colonial cartography of representational evacuation. The Black Shoals, the otherwise, Liquid beingness, wet spores, air conditioning, the new luxury of survivance on the planet that has been, is becoming uninhabitable. The undoing of ecological precarity, an inversion layer and its humid bubble in the global south 
where it's now impossible to get cool in certain places, sometimes India, the state that supposedly awaits us all. It's not comforting as we sit here hot, hot ourselves, right, to talk about the environment in a non-normative way. It's becoming less comfortable to live in it. When the super fires happened two summers ago, I was in Sausalito, California, walking around the bay, seeing the ash fall into the ocean. And I was thinking about Etel Adnan, the great uh, Lebanese artist and thinker. I was thinking about her philosophical poetry. It was only later that I found out that she's queer, that was actually removed from many of her obituaries. Even though her visual and her poetic aesthetic of minimalism, of bright color, of brilliance, to me is the epitome of a diasporic, queer, sea edge kind of visual, imaginary. And sea and fog that was written while she lived in Sausalito, Ednen watches the fog and she anticipates the fires. She actually does that in the book. She realizes that she is hovering, almost trapped in a zone of whiteness. Before Adnan moved to France, where she died very recently, she made her home watching the fog and then watching the fires of the Bay Area. I wonder about the home that she's made in the estrangement of California with her partner, her exploration of the spirit of the natural world, her way of immersing her consciousness into the presence of the world. Quote, there's a moment to the moment, unquote, Adnan says, where we're in the world. For none, as for me, writing is this presence, a way to reveal the starkness of matter and anti-matter, a way to break with the violence of the colonial order, a way to commune with the sublime. And six, oysters will, might save us, and this is where I end. What kinds of artistic undercurrents and decolonial queer imaginaries then offer a way forward? It's clear that we're in a time of exhaustion, depletion, whether of our own human resources or exhaustion of Western onto epistemic power or of carbon empires or of underemployment, of environmental degradation and a million, billion other ways we may diagnose utter resignation and fatigue. In my exhaustion, I imagine the labor of the oyster, who can filter as much as 50 gallons of polluted water a day, filtering sediment, phosphorus, and nitrogen in bay water by consuming and compacting these toxicities into neat little deposits that are then put at the bottom of riverbeds or flow down into riverbeds, into estuaries, into river flows. Oysters filter toxins through a liquid body, through their squashy flesh, through tender bits. Behind them, they leave industrial waters clean. Along the East River, near my home in Brooklyn, New York, there's a project that I admire. It's called the Billion Oyster Project. And it's run by black women scientists and marine biologists, by those who will have Governor's Island upon La Nape Hoking territories clean by 2050. When I hear the name The Billion Oyster Project, I think of Catherine Yusuf's work that outlines a billion black Anthropocenes, a billion ways that the genealogies of black Atlantic slave trade have already occurred a billion forms of potential nodes of black feminist repair. I do not imagine that the oyster wants me to be like it. Instead, I want to be like it. To constantly make myself useful anew by inhabiting, detaching easily, filtering, recycling, upcycling, etc. A critical oyster vocabulary for knowing thyself as a starting point of any critical elaboration. And this is really the practice that I want to leave today. This decolonial queer femme oyster orientation that processes, embodies, enacts, it purifies, 
it works to perceive and make the world anew, not in the imagination of ourselves, but in the proliferation of many ways of living this earthly existence as a mere matter of queer liquidity. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much again to Macarena Gomez Paris. My question is, what is it about liquidity, water, the sea, and also the edge? So how liquidity and water also have a direct relationship with the sea's edge or the concept of being on the edge. What is it about these things that um, speak to you? Because it's um, like a current in your work and it's gonna keep being a current in your work and line of thinking. Yeah. I don't know, I think you, it's very difficult to get away from certain lines of thought, you know, that have obsessed me for a long time. And the undercurrents is one of those. I think you know, and beyond the pink tide, I wrote a lot about what it means for us to think about, you know, gathering in the spaces below um, the organization of the state or outside of institutions or in places of other kinds of ways of convening, assembly, et cetera. And of course, that undercurrent is really a metaphor. And, you know, it, it plays with um, the undercommons, Moton and Harney's idea, but it's also interested in a particular moment that we're having in the Americas, which is very complicated, like it is the world over, right? Politically, uh, where you have deep projects for social transformation, like you have in Chile, in Colombia, uh, deeply fought projects. And on the one hand, on the other, this incredible resurgence of white nationalism, of fascism, of authoritarianism. And I think I'm just interested in potentially getting out of certain kinds of binaries within our political vocabularies. And for me, this, these spaces of the edge or other kinds of ways to imagine beingness potentially do that. But it owes a lot to, you know, to these spaces, to Stuart Hall's cultural studies, to the idea of the subaltern, the sub, the submerged, the subaltern, the, all of that unlocking, all of that critical vocabulary that I've learned so much from. And what became clear to me listening to your um, talk just now and also knowing your other work and that you also write in nonfiction and there are many different layers and registers that are being brought together where in the end you were just speaking about embodied practice. I feel that your writing is also something that is a practice for you and mm. all of the principles and ideas that you are exploring, it feels like they connect with personal narratives. So when mm. you're speaking about the sea's edge and submerged perspectives and basements, um, <laughs> you're also speaking about you know, queer clubs and going to the basement and bodies coming together. And I was just wondering how that works for you and how, what are your, what do you hope to achieve by bringing, you know, embodied knowledge and experiences together with, you know, important and groundbreaking ideas to progress the discourse further? I mean, I, I have talked about queer clubs in, you know, the incredible makeshift clubs of East LA and Laura Aguilar's photography, for instance, and how she documented butch femme narratives and butch femme working class Latina Chicanx culture at a particular moment. And I, I am very interested in these shifty spaces, shall we say, um, that again, operate be below certain kinds of organizations and um, you know, uh, what Denise Ferreira da Silva calls the ontology, right? To speak to the ontology of Western being. So I'm, I'm really interested in the sub for all those reasons. And, you know, I'm, memoir is not a, I don't love memoir. I haven't always loved memoir. I've been thinking a lot with poets, thinking a lot about how the eye is important there. And, if you noticed in that piece, I was oscillating between the I and the we, 
the we as a problematic space because then it, you know, begins to encapsulate many, many different kinds of experiences. The I has its own problematic narcissistic tendencies. No pronoun as we know now is fully satisfying, but really playing with that, playing with language, trying to think about um, first person plural, trying to think sometimes in the second person, third person. So really trying to shift registers. And I think in part because these last several years now, I have personally felt exhausted by um, a kind of academic vocabulary that is extremely wordy. I use it too. Um, but I'm interested in like breaking open language in interesting ways. I, and, and often trying to bring in, you know, the Spanish language or bringing in echoes of the places. So I actually, some of that is just uh, co mere coincidences. I was already writing about bells. I didn't know about Seba's bells. I have written about bells in the past and the river. So some of that is just allowing for, you know, the kind of invisible forces of beautiful coincidences that, uh, you know, to think from there. I think what you said about different languages, I remember in the Queer Currents podcast episode, mm -hmm. you really talk about lo queer and mm -hmm. how that is a different, I guess, register as the queer in your work and then your focus in the Americas. Can you tell about this bringing in of different mm. languages in the current discourse and what that does for you and for everyone. Yes. I mean, I think there's been, you know, in Latin America often, I, I write mostly in English. I don't have a lot to say necessarily to Latin Americans, although recently the extractive zone was translated into Spanish. And I think it's had some legs there precisely because sometimes it's difficult to speak back to the corporate state from the position of those upon territories who are, you know, like doubly, triply marginalized within those nation states, especially indigenous peoples. Um, but, you know, often when I'm thinking in English, I'm thinking about translation for US and European audiences of all the incredible creative potential all the experiences that have already happened in relationship to things that are delayed. So there is something as queer time, I think, in the world. And there is something to be learned from, you know, the global south, to put it in a very um, in one, one terminology, about what's going to be experienced later here in terms of climate catastrophe. And so I'm interested in, in doing that. Um, Lo queer for me is to honor the fact that queer was sometimes seen as a terminology of imperialism, uh, you know, that was translated in that way. And I really love actually Jack's uh, opening, I don't know if anyone's read it in Spanish, uh, to um, female masculinity, um, masculinidades femeninas in español. And what Jack does there is beautiful because they take terms from across the Americas and talk about the tortillera or talk about camionera or different ways in which queerness is discussed within very local working class communities rather than the terms of the Anglophone terms. Um, I think Seba and I tried to do this and Seba does this beautifully in, in a response to me in the interview where there are these multiple, multiple categories of gender transitivity and sex transitivity in Mapuche cultural forms, and they do not get chronicled. They fall away in the Spanish ar colonial archive. And so what does it mean to rescue those, to resurge those, and to think from those terminologies? Absolutely. And now that you mentioned your conversation with Seba, there's something that you write in there and that you discuss with them, um, which is about um, the earth depletion based uh, and being dependent upon the somatic labor of the racialized female trans femme body. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk a little bit more about yeah. that in relation also to Seba's work? Yeah. You know, it's really interesting because I, I really try, and I, I'm not sure if I'm successful, but to not separate the visual artist from the theorist, right? Because I'm so often in conversation with artists and learning theoretically from them. And this is something I actually learned from um, 
uh, Regina um, Galindo's work in that she's often putting her own brown guatemalteca misticia body in the way of the bulldozer in a space of extraction, in an earth wound, for instance, in as you know, it, very precarious conditions. And I think I've learned a lot about what it means to not follow a kind of European theorization, feminist European white feminisms that has talked about, you know, if we think about land as essential, you know, uh, as woman, then the, it centralizes the body, it centralizes the category woman. I think we have to think much more complexly about this relation between the body and land, tierra, cuerpo, you know, in, in ways that are much more capacious. And I think visual artists are doing that. Seva Calfuque, you saw that immersion today. And that's very much, very clear to me mm. that there's no separation there. Absolutely, and I, um, I noticed that you work also with the space of the otherwise. Mm. Um, you are keen to queer otherwise, to colonize otherwise. What is the space of the otherwise for you and what does it signify? Yeah, so there's a more, you know, there's a way in which in the academy and the kind of decolonial theory school, the otherwise has become this just this way to think outside of the normative categories. But one of the things I've been arguing since the extractive zone is that I'm frustrated with uh, the absence of kind of gender and sex analysis in relationship to the decolonial. And so that's part of why I'm trying to queer the otherwise. The otherwise is not just, you know, we take with us all of the same kinds of ways of understanding and organizing sociality in life that are, you know, if we're not questioning them, if we're not um, detaching them from the colonial, if we're not delinking, actively delinking from the colonial, I think we have those same problems, you know, emerge again. So for me, it's just about really constantly that process that I was talking about in the opening, questioning, opening up, questioning, opening up, making space. I'm really interested in making space. So that's the other ways, how to make more space. Let's do more of that and let's open yes. space. So I wonder, if I have more questions, but I want to open uh, to questions in the audience. If anyone feels that they want to ask a question, please raise your hand and a microphone will come to you. As you're thinking about comments or questions, um, you know, what's so interesting is that in the hall, I just saw three or four people that I've only met you on Zoom, right? Because we've done events together on Zoom. And now suddenly we're able to see each other and be um, in close contact. So that's just a really interesting moment that we're in, you know. Uh, very happy to see people and hear from you. Hi, I have a question. Oh, maybe more of a comment for you. Um, I'm myself indigenous and very interested in all of these topics. And I would say Sylvia Winter has written a beautiful paper where she honors the work of Judith Butler in uh, talking about gender as performative and links it to her own scholarship. So that's a really good example of an intersection between a great deep colonial thinker and um, looking at gender issues. I just wanted to. It's a great comment. Yeah, I mean, I think we're just seeing the kind of wave and impact of Winterian thinking, you know, uh, sweeping across the world. And of course, her work on 1492 is very interesting. There's also a history there um, in her own training of Spanish literature. And so that capacity to really see and think from multiple um, spaces about uh, blackness in those histories. So thank you very much for that. I can't really see you because the lights are very bright up here, but thank you. I really appreciate that comment. Hi, uh, I was just wondering, could you say some more about uh, demology terms for queerness and chronicling them, and who gets to rescue and conserve and preserve those terminologies? Mm. I'm just, I'm just wondering who, who, who is it who does that? Is, that the, is, is, is it academia that does that? Is it people on the streets? 
how, how do we go about it, ensuring inc more inclusion? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that academia is its own space of elitism, of privilege, of institutionalization, of resources, right? Of knowledge production. And there are many turns happening right now in higher education that are important and are having to really consider what academic labor is in this moment, how it's remunerated, what those colonial hierarchies and memories are within the institutions, often upon indigenous territories, often upon other people's land spaces. I don't see it solely as the kind of institutional archivists or scholars work to do that kind of proliferation of languaging, but it is one space where knowledge production is made, and it's an important space, I think, for undoing, remaking what Jack is gonna to call tomorrow unworlding, making anew. So, but I think that, you know, people are creative, communities are creative, it's already, terminologies that have already circulated. What I do think is important in the case of Seba and other indigenous peoples in this current moment is really figuring out because often, even in say Chile, right? It was only 10 years ago, maybe 15, that there was a dictionary between Spanish and Mapuzungun, right? Um, Cecilia Vicuña actually published uh, the first trilogy, English, Spanish, Mapuzungun, and potentially even other indigenous languages of poetry. So within the space of literacy, right, or the kind of world of books and uh, written ideas, I think it does matter to figure out how to proliferate that. So maybe writers do have some responsibility there. But those terminologies are already circulating and played with and changed. And as we know by young people in social media, there's like a zillion categories for gender transitivity now. So I do think there's, we have to think about the, the historical record though in, in new ways in this moment. Thank you for that very thought provoking comment and question. Great. Um. I wanted to ask you something that we've been discussing the past couple of days, like you've been here, um, and it's you know a really key intention for our work together. Mm. And I wanted to ask up from your position and um, the communities and um, bodies that you encounter, what is what is it at stake uh, today for um, you know people that work in universities or art institutions? in collaboration with um, artists and visual practitioners for you? What, what are we trying mm. to do and how can we do better? You're doing great, Costas. <laughs> I mean, I think the Serpentine is really an important space. Um, you know, I'm often asked this. Recently, I, w I kind of consulted for a European consortium of eight ethnographic museums, and the question was, well, what do we do now? <laughs> we have all these collections, and we know they're stolen artifacts, and you know that's why I was kind of bringing in Dion Brown's work in ossuaries and this kind of fossilized thinking as part of the problem, right? And thinking about um, return, repair, these kinds of practices. I mean, I think there's the thing I'd say is that you know, especially during the pandemic when there's been so much kind of collective depression, you know, struggle for public spaces, struggle to keep certain kinds of small businesses open, struggle for experimental, you know, collectives to, to kind of thrive in the context of uh, really um, poorly resourced, um, you know, uh, in a poorly resourced world in terms of money and its circulation and who has access to it. I mean, I, I actually worry right now for those third spaces. So I'm actually going in the opposite direction. And even though I was part of Strike MoMA, actually at the moment that Jack um, had a film there, so that created another dinner table conversation. But, you know, even though I was part of Strike MoMA and the ways in which there was an intent to say, look at your board of trustees, 
look at their extractive practices, look at the weapons manufacturing industry, think about where the money comes from, follow the money. At the same time, I felt very uneasy about that because it's a new moment, right? You are, you do have black and indigenous curators, you do have a Seva Calfuquea in London at the Serpentine doing beautiful performance work. And so it's that old question of how much stays put and how much shifts and how we can do both at the same time. So I just want to not answer your question, but I think raise more questions and also say that I'm not willing to give up those spaces because we know what that looks like too. To give up those spaces means returning to more privatization, private homes, the domestic, and especially for queers, that feels really dangerous. <laughs>